Good evening, everybody. Um, we will do the uh, interview and the um, reactions in, in English because that's the most convenient language. Uh, welcome, uh, Francisco Ferrandis. Um, like was explained, you are an anthropologist, but you are specialized and was involved from the first moment on in this updigging of the graves in Spain. Yes. Well, actually, I, I started to do research right after this movie was released. Yeah. This movie, by the way, is approximately 2002, I yeah. think, somewhere uh, around that year. Basically, probably we both met in the same area because uh, I was there too in the first diggings, which was very impressive, and, uh, as you could see in this uh, um, this television reportage that it, it indeed was a very moving thing to watch and to be uh, to be there. Um, okay, so you were involved from the start uh, in, in let's say this new digging up of the past of Spain. This is ten years ago. Meanwhile, things have changed, or th some things have happened. Perhaps you could resume a little what has happened after. This situation basically broke out in 2002 that finally the whole idea about these mass graves in Spain, which were approximately well, many ten thousand spread all over Spain, uh, broke out, came to light, and, and started to be a, a public, uh, public thing and also into, converted itself into a public discussion. Could you resume a bit? What happened afterwards? It's, 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 it's a lot, a lot of time. <laughs> it's very difficult to resume what has happened in ten years, and, and I, I think actually that the movie does it uh, uh, in a in a wonderful way. Just just to to, to put the, 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 this movie in, in context, it, it comes uh, very early in the process, as Steve uh, has just said, because it was uh, released in 2003. And this uh, the exhumation uh, took place in, in Piedra Fita de Bavia, took place in 2002. It was one of the first. The very first exhumations, and I will I will I will talk a little bit about this. So uh, it's uh, no, it, it was very a uh, very courageous film because uh, it was uh, it had a lot of impact. It was uh, it's basically it was uh, produced by a, a, a Catalonian a Catalonian uh, the Catalonian public TV, and it was broadcast in Catalonia uh, in a longer version, and it also was broadcast later in. In, uh, in Spanish TVs and then in other, you know, thematic channels, and it was, you know, this English version went throughout the U.S. and and uh, now uh, Montserrat Mengo, who is the producer of this film, she's a very famous filmmaker. I mean, she's uh, there are like papers, you know, like uh, academic papers written on this movie, and so she she made it, you know, um, all the way. And it's, uh, I think it's it's important to to have this uh, to put this in, in this perspective. But on the other hand, on the other hand. Um, it reflects uh, these very early stages, and so many things have happened since then that it's kind of difficult to, to, to recognize, uh, the, the, you know, what's going on, what's going on uh, there. So um, I wanted to say a few things just to just to throw some ideas, maybe so we, have, we can have a debate instead of me giving a full pledge. Uh, yeah, that's by the way. After this first introduction. Uh, I, I will ask some questions, but I also invite you, if you have any questions, or any remarks, or any reflections you want to bring in, go ahead. There is a mic, I think, somewhere. In. Yeah. So just put up your hand and uh, ask for attention and try to give you also room for questions and remarks. Okay. See, I, uh, I, um, a lot of times people ask me, uh, why is Spain opening up mass graves in the 21st century? And, and I think this is something that has to be, uh, uh, you know, dealt with uh, just head on. Uh, in the very last part of the of the of the movie, you could see uh, this exhumation in Soto de Aldovea, in uh, close to Madrid. You could see the bodies. I mean, this this was 1930, 1939. So, uh, what 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 uh, the 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 mass graves that are being dug in the 21st century are the leftovers of the, the, civil, the, the civil war mass graves. And we are talking not, not about front lines, we are talking all the time about rear guard repression. No? This rear guard repression, you could see that historians had their theories about uh, how many of them were killed in, in each side, what were the characteristics of the repression on one side or, or, or the other. 
So during the first, uh, say, seven, ten years of, of the dictatorship, there, there were a lot of exclamations throughout Spain, big ones, like uh, 1,500 people, some smaller ones in the, in, the, in the villages. And there was also a judicial uh, procedure in which, uh, you know, their names were recorded and the circumstances of their killings were also researched. This was uh, basically managed by the Supreme Tribunal. So there was like a whole structure of exclamations in place, which uh, you know allowed people who were on the winning side to claim the bodies or uh, of their uh, relatives, uh, uh, both killed in front lines and, and, and particularly in the rear. To, to make it clear, that was only from the Franco side. Yeah. The bodies were uh, digged up and gave a decent grave and were remembered as. Yeah, that's 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 exactly what happened. And on top of that. Uh, uh, there, there was a, like a political ideology that we call we call in Spain national Catholicism, which came out you know, of the tensions within Francoism between the different factors, uh, Carlistas, uh, Falangistas, Traditionalistas, the Church and whatnot. So, it, but it was basically based on the, uh, the Church's idea of that this was, this was a, a crusade and uh, this idea of heroism and martyrdom and, and uh, the fall and <coughs> God and for Spain and God and whatnot. So there, there was a whole uh, ideological structure um, justifying and uh, and also there were like rituals, uh, state rituals and uh, state funerals, you know, that were uh, accompanying the the, uh, the exhumation of these bodies. On the other side, the bodies of the defeated were just, you know, thrown into oblivion, oblivion and silence. There was even uh, uh, legislation that we have we have found the legislation in which we, they say, well. You should, you know, dig out, uh, dig up these these graves, which you know reflect the, the suffering of the civil war, only if they were killed by the Marxists. Which means that it was, I mean, these these mass graves that are being dug today were excluded also legally from the the legal community. I mean, the the community of the death, so to speak. No? This was like the first wave of exhumations. Then in, 19, in the in the in the late 50s, 1958. I don't know if you've heard about uh, the Valley of the Fallen in Spain, El Valle de los Caídos, which is uh, one of the most bizarre fascist uh, monuments uh, in, in the whole of Europe. I don't know if any. So it was built during during 20 years. It was Franco's idea, pharaonic in a sense, because he, he wanted to do uh, he, he wanted it to be like the burial place for those killed in the civil war. I mean, it was like huge. Uh, architectonical and symbolic project, which is now in the outskirts of um, of Madrid, and uh, what, what happened is that in 1958, after two, two, 20 years after you know they started building, it took them a, a, a very very long time. It has the biggest cross in Christian Dome, you know, it's huge, 150 meters tall. I mean, the, the basilica is the second biggest in the Christian in Christian Dome. I mean, it's, it's a huge monument. So they 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 they. they um, they uh, realized that uh, they had no bodies, that uh, no bodies, literally. I mean that that this was a pantheon, and it should be filled with uh, with bodies. And uh, by the time of the inauguration, there were no bodies. So what uh, they, they did is like they they uh, asked, you know, uh, the different administrations from the central state to the to the to the to the municipalities. They asked for bodies to be brought to this uh, to this monument, and. Uh, in the first uh, five, six years, you know, maybe uh, 20,000 people were brought to the Valley of the Fallen. Already came people who were unburied. It was the second burial for, for a lot of them. And now we know that uh, 33,000, 33, almost 34,000 bodies were removed 20 years after the war to, to this big, this big uh, monument, which is the, like the, the, it explains, it, it expresses the, the, uh, the, Frank, the symbolism of Francoism. You know, at, at its, its best. Uh, now we, we are learning to know that the, you know, in this movement of bodies, 20 years after the war, um, when uh, in, the, in some municipalities they were they had a lot of pressure to produce bodies for this huge project, Franco's project. So when they didn't have any of you know winners in the war, they said, well, they they, they dug some of the mass graves of the defeated without obviously asking their relatives or anything like this. So the, the discovery of, of this fact that, that 12,000 of the 35,000 which are in the, in, the, in, the, in the Valley of the Fallen, 10,000, 10, 12,000 of them are unknown and might be Republicans brought to Franco's monument has also caused you know, a lot of um, uh, problems in, 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 
participate in the last uh, few years. If you I can, I can re recommend that for everybody who, who is in Madrid to have a, a little visit to this uh, Valle Los Caídos, um, because it is indeed a very curious and, and, and serious monument, which says something about also not only the craziness of the dictatorship and the way they created this bombastic monument, but also a bit about the problems of today's Spain. If you go there, you never will see any explanation of what it is actually is. It is the grave of Franco, who is still buried there. Um, it's a huge cathedral, but into the cathedral, in the Thumbs, you have these 33,000 bodies. And part of the bodies are of Republicans. And uh, most of them are unknown, but some are known, and their family eagerly wants to get them out as soon as possible because they don't want to have their relatives into a monument of Franco. Um, this is one of the only small parts of the craziness of the whole monument, which is really a problem still in today's Spain because it also represents a bit the difficulties Spain actually has with this past of a civil war and a long time dictatorship afterwards. Um, perhaps you could tell something about what happened after this uh, movie. They started, uh, there was this association of Emilio Silva, who's also be in, uh, interviewed in the, in, in the, in the movie. Uh, they started not only to dig up um, the corpses, but also, by the way, corpses, how, how many people are there still buried? There are some estimations. Well, the estimation is, uh, but the thing is that the research is, is not finished and a lot of documents have disappeared, so we don't know the exact figures, but to, to say in round numbers, Republican repression amounted to 50,000, whereas nationalist, so to speak, or uh, rebels uh, repression amounts to 150,000 in mass graves, buried in mass graves. What has happened is that a lot of them have, have disappeared because of the you know, the, the development of infrastructures, the expansion of the municipalities, the, the transformation in the cemeteries, because a lot of them were just buried outside of the cemetery walls. They were shot there. Some of them are inside the cemeteries, but they were, you know, they buried people on top of them, impossible to find. So nobody really knows how many of them are left. But more than 100,000, that's for sure, are still in the ground of Spain. They have disappeared, but yeah. uh, probably for, for good. I mean, some of them will, we won't be able to find them. Some of them were, I mean, it appears in the movie, some of them were thrown, you know, to the sea or from bridges or in lakes or in different, mm. or different modalities of disappearance. Now, this is part of, of, a, of a system of amnesia, as was already more or less explained uh, at the start of this meeting, uh, a, a kind of forgetting your past. Um, the people, of course, who are buried in this mass grave, but there's a lot of more, or there was a lot more when this movie was made in 2002. There were still monuments of Franco on the street in plain Madrid. There were still a lot of street, streets um, called uh, like the generals of his army. Uh, there were still all the memory um, placades on public places. Um, starting with this dugging up this grave, it set in motion um, a kind of new legislation which tried to end yeah. more or less this, um, well, stop of memory, this uh, amnesia, which up till then was more or less the case. Yeah. See, what, what, what happened is that uh, we can, and also to relate to what Nancy was saying before, in terms of transitional justice, this is a bottom-up transitional justice process, in the sense that it was uh, these associations, and you've, you've seen here in the movie, Emilio Silva, who spoke more, and Santiago Macias, who just uh, really appeared, who were just to, I mean, Emilio Silva is a journalist and sociologist. He just wanted to go for his grandfather. And uh, the thing is that as a journalist, he knew how to project it, you know, in the, into the media. And he's, he's been very good at it in the last decade. And, uh, and so the, the part of it is like, the, there started to be a public awareness that it was happening. So uh, this started to, to put some pressure in the different, uh, in the different uh, institutional levels, in the municipal levels, if you go to a village, you, you know, suddenly there is a lot of people like, what's going on here? I mean, there is like this machine coming, these archaeologists, and some people were for, and some people against, and so mayors and the, in, in, uh, the other, 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 
other other uh, politicians in the local level had to deal with it. Then in the bigger levels also they, they had to, 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 to make some rules for this to happen. No? And then the whole thing got all the way up to the to the to the central state. And uh, this is one of the important things that happened after after this movie is that uh, in year, uh, this started during the tenure of um, uh, Jose Maria Aznar, uh, who is a right winger. And, uh, that was the former uh, former president, yeah. president of the, the prime minister of, the, of, of Spain, who was two terms in power and, and finally uh, lost the elections. Uh, was changed into a socialist government under Zapatero. Now we are back again under a, a, a right-wing government, but at the moment that this was filmed, José María Aznar, a right-wing um, government, was in power. Well, why, why is that important, by the way? I mean, no, it's, it's not important, it's just, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, well, it's important. <laughs> but they were very courageous, because Aznar is just like, he's a really he's a tough, you know. But the, the thing is that, um, I just forgot to say something, it's just one minute, and I'll, I'll go, back, back, go back to this idea. I was talking about the Valley of the Fallen and, and all this huge movement of bodies in the, in the uh, started in the late, I mean, 19, uh, 1959, da, da, da. Uh, re, re, regarding the, the, the mass graves of the defeated, uh, the, some of them were exhumed during a clandestine way during the dictatorship. And then after Franco died, there was another movement of exhumations, but they were more informal, they didn't have technical, uh, <coughs> personnel working with them, they would go with their space and just, you know, they would, they would count the bodies because of the skulls, you know, there are 20 people because there are 20 skulls, but not, and so uh, th this is also uh, like a precedent of what Emilio Silva did in the year 2000, but what separates the 21st century exhumation from the former ones are like the expo exposure to the media and also the, 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 the fact that there are technical teams working on them, you know, and, so this creates a new set of problems. But then going back to your question, um, <coughs> this had, uh, the year 2000 is kind of emblematic because you know it's the change of the century, and also this, this is because the year that when Emilio Silva opened this gate that everybody thinks is, I mean, uh, uh, acknowledges it's the, the origin of this uh, this this uh, this, l this le le last le latest fi phase of the of the excavation process in Spain. So what happened is that uh, when Zapatero, uh, uh, when Aznar, well, it was not Aznar, Rajoy, who is now in power, lost the election to Zapatero in 2004, he gave an initial speech saying, like, uh, my grandfather, not my father, uh, no, it was his grandfather, well, grandfather was killed also, he was shot. He, but he was a military, he was shot, you know, in the because he was loyal to the Republican and whatnot. And he, the grandfather of, 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 of the president. So yeah. he, he belonged to this generation of grand, grandsons of the defeat. So he, his grandfather had been shot also by, by Franco's army. So he, in his initial speech he said, I won't forget this because he's my main inspiration and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then th there was a lot of hope you know, in the associations that somebody, somebody big was going to happen with, with Zapatero. And actually he promoted a, a law, but, which is called the Law of Historical Memory, which was finally approved in the year 2007. And so this is an important, uh, in terms of transitional justice, this is an important fact that uh, there was a law passed by, by, by Parliament with a huge controversy. I mean, you, you've heard these people which are very nostalgic of Franco at the very end of the of the, of the movie, which is kind of a caricature of what Spain used to be during Francoism. But uh, so th there was uh, there was a huge controversy in the country, uh, the political party. I mean, it was a lot, a lot of uh, it was very messy these years. I mean, from 2006 to 2000, 2007, these years, you know that the issue was comp all, uh, all the time in the news and blah blah blah. So what happened is that when this law was passed, uh, a lot of the associations cried foul. They said. This is not enough. This is just a, a very, very shy law. Uh, you are afraid of what? Uh, what, what exactly did the law promote? <coughs> well, the law, uh, it's very complex and, uh, but what? Well, in shortcut. In shortcut, in shortcut. There are like two or three things that, that really uh, 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 bother, you know, some of the associations. One of them was that they wanted uh, the, the, <coughs> the, the trials the, 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 the military trials which brought 100,000 people to, to, to the shootings, they wanted them to be declared illegal. 
he said, I want my, because my father died as a criminal, or my grandfather died as a criminal, because there was a criminal uh, military trial, and he, I mean, there were kangaroo trials, but, you know, there, there is an official paper saying that he was a delinquent, that he was killed for that. They wanted to clean up their names. So they, they asked the government, you, sh you have to declare these, 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 these trials illegal. And the government said, no, illegal is too much. Let's make them illegitimate, which symbolically is something, but it's not quite what they, what they were wanted to, to do, what, what they wanted from, from the government. And then in terms of the exhumations, uh, they said that they would facilitate the exhumations, but the state wouldn't take responsibility for, for, for these exhumations, and that there would be no judicial uh, uh, effect. effect. Uh, nobody was going to be brought to trial uh, because of these crimes. And so they completely cried foul, and then they, they decided uh, to go the judicial way. Uh, uh, they already had it in their minds, because uh, when you hear Emilio Silva, he was already talking about the international convention in 2002, he was talking about uh, 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 human rights, blah, 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 all these discourses. No? So what, what happened is that uh, they started to file complaints to uh, what we call in Spain the Audiencia Nacional, which is a very special judicial, uh, judicial body. Uh, court, uh, court. Court for the bigger cases, the bigger national cases. Yeah, for the bigger cases. national cases, yeah. and which also has competences over human rights violations throughout the world. And actually, it, it, it's hearing cases like, for example, from Guantanamo, from Israel, and some other, uh, uh, Guatemala, and some other cases in the world. So, and also they, they did, all the, the whole process of uh, uh, indicting Pinochet started there, you know, uh, Maltazar Garzón, probably you, you know him. So what they did is like, uh, they would file these complaints, and did, uh, this is something they have, already, they have told me personally, you know? like they, they filed a complaint when he was on duty, because they wanted him to take the case. Uh, him, him, in this case, is Baltasar Garzón, who used to be Spanish super judge, that was more or less his, uh, his nickname, uh, he was the one who, in, in terms of international justice, got a lot of fame because he broke open the process of, uh, of Pinochet and, and made a precedent of uh, hunting down um, people who uh, were accused for um, international genocide and, and uh, human rights uh, crimes also without any border. So he created this precedent long before the whole case, like uh, you said, was brought for the Spanish court. That already was a moment that many Spaniards said, okay, what, what's happening here? We are, uh, one of our judges is hunting down a Chilean dictator, but we can't cope with our own dictator, who is dead, of course. But anyway, there is a lot of people still involved with this dictatorship who are alive, and nothing is happening. So. Yes, well, <laughs> what happened? you explained it perfectly. Well, what happened? It's very sad. It's a very sad story. But uh, actually, uh, it's, it's very interesting because uh, they, they wanted Garzón, because uh, none of the other judges in this uh, tribunal uh, had this uh, international prestige or had, had been involved in this. So, or had this, uh, uh, you know, had been involved in such, in such cases. So, they went in, you know, what is he on duty this day? They would just file a complaint, so it would go to his desk. No? So uh, this is this was this was you know a strategic move by some of the associations. Some of the associations uh, were not. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, we can talk about this later because the associations are very different now, and they are very uh, you know they are a lot of conflicts between. There are a lot of conflicts between them, and we we, talk, we can talk about also the associative movement if you if you wish. But what happened here is that Garzón in 2008, on October 2008, he indicted Francoism globally. So he said, well, these are crimes against humanity. He brought, basically, he brought uh, uh, the inter international uh, human rights law to the, to, to the Spanish case, uh, particularly through the figure of the forced disappearances, which uh, was already settled as a, as a universal crime the year before, the 2007. It was already established. So he applied all this international uh, human rights law, uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, to, the Spanish, uh, to the Spanish case. You can imagine the scandal in the, in the, the whole country, I mean, the, the front lines of the newspaper. You can talk about that maybe. Like, uh, yeah. Well, just to go back again, you say, okay, you can imagine the scandal. A lot of people here can't imagine the scandal. 
The thing is that um, what a lot of people perhaps don't know is what actually happened, why Spain didn't talk about these kind of uh, scandals, these kind of crimes during the civil war and the um, dictatorship afterwards. All those years, in 75, dictator Franco died, then uh, the so-called transition <coughs> started the transition to democracy which very fastly actually and without not too many problems changed Spain from a dictatorship one of the last dictatorships together with Portugal in Europe into a democracy but part of this um, transition was that in 77, uh, 77 there was a general amnesty so all the crimes committed under the Franco regime were completely out of any um, juridical um, process and the things were close more or less it was part of the transition it was a kind of deal between the right and the left just we won't talk anymore about what happened why well that's the big question uh, uh, well actually because maybe uh, uh, we were talking about this uh, before, uh, you know, when we have we were having a drink before the, 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 the movie. And I, I think uh, uh, it, it's, it has to do with some, with, with a generational change. And uh, uh, there, there was a, uh, the generation which led the transition to democracy that uh, it's, it's, it's very prestigious in the, you know, in the world. I mean, it's like, uh, it's like one, one of the best examples of how you can go from a dictatorship into a democratic regime without bloodshed, without hurting too much the society, you know. And it has been used as an example even in Latin America, some of the transitions were, you know, let's follow the Spanish model and whatnot. So what, um, uh, and this was actually a pact, but uh, uh, which, between the, 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 you know, the, the, the hearse of Franco and the, and the people who had been in exile or in the clandestine, had been clandestine during the, I mean, the anti-Francoist, anti -Francoist. Um, uh, political parties and, and leaders, and they, they, they got to this agreement, and, and, but it was under the influence of a very powerful military, which was kind of monitoring the, the, the process. So, um, for the generation which was leading the transition, that, that was enough, and what they, they did what they, they could. This is what they, I mean, when, when, when you ask them, why didn't you deal with this really terrible situation? mass graves, for example, they could say, we couldn't do more, you know, it, it was uh, way enough. I mean, we, we gave you the demo democracy, now do, you, you, can do, you can continue follow up with whatever you want. But now there is a new generation, and it's basically the grandsons, and now great grandsons of those who were executed, who are not happy, with, you know, with the kinds of agreements that, uh, that, uh, that were, you know, uh, <coughs> taken during the, this transition to democracy. And actually, we were just talking before about uh, one, the last, uh, in his blog, Emilio Silva has a blog, uh, this, the, the leader of the, the media association in Spain, and he, he, he kind of, he made a, a comparison between Spanish transition to democracy and the, the, this film, The Truman Show. No? The, the, we were living in this kind of uh, bubble. And the, uh, you the know the Truman movie, Show, perhaps? The Truman Show, you know the, the, the movie, movie? It's about this guy who is more or less yeah. living in a completely artificial show world, which is set for, up in, for him up, um, but he doesn't know. And then one day he started to discover that something is wrong, and he started to discover that this whole complete... Uh, he, he's basically... Uh, in a reality show. In a reality show, which is, uh, which is true. He is in a reality show. Uh, without knowing it. Um, the comparison is that Emilio Silva, who was the leader of this movement, said that now, at this moment in Spain, um, because of all the scandals, because of the economic reality, which goes very, very bad in Spain, because of the loss of trust in politics, in all the institutions, in the juridical system, in everything, Spain more or less is feeling itself like this Truman who suddenly discovers that this whole story of uh, living up with Spain as a, as a beautiful transition in democracy was fake. And now a lot of the frustrations come up again. So that was more or less his comparison. But to go back, 
wasn't it also part of the transition? Uh, of course, in Holland, for instance, we have a lot of reflection on the Second World War. For a lot of people, that has been a kind of moral compass in a lot of the activities, political and moral, after the war. The problem, of course, in Spain, that you had two Spains, which more or less split the country uh, within villages, within families. Your own family was part on the Franco side, part on the Republican side. That must have been so horrible that perhaps people said, OK, we are not going to do it all over again, just close the page of the book and we don't talk about it anymore. Was that more, more or less the feeling? Or the yeah, but it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work because uh, when, when they started to open up these mass graves, there was, I mean, it was like powder. You know, <laughs> like uh, this Emilio Silva and this, this uh, incipient uh, association started to get tens and then hundreds and then thousands of requests to get the bodies of their relatives. And this meant that there was, uh, there was something in the society I mean, there, were, there, were, there was a demand in society for this uh, thing, for this thing to happen, which meant that this book, you know, fell from the shelf and, uh, and was uh, and was reopened. But now we can see that maybe this is not going to last forever. I mean, whenever, whenever there is a revisit of the traumatic past in a country, I mean, you cannot agonize for 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 for, for ages on it. And now we are, we are seeing. I mean, we have entered a new phase of city, and I, I wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about this because uh, just to go back to Garzón, Garzón was stopped back on his tracks. So, a month after he indicted Francoism and used uh, concepts like crimes against humanity were committed by Franco's troops, this, 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 these crimes do not prescribe, they have to be judged. These people are disappeared, you know, they, they, these, these are forced disappearances. The state and the judicial system uh, reacted against him, <coughs> and they said, but we have a transition, this, this, there was an amnesty law, we cannot revert the amnesty law. In, in, in Spanish penal law, uh, a crime stops being committed, so to speak, in 20 years, so it has, it, these crimes, if they were crimes, have, have been prescribed three times, plus the amnesty law, four times, four prescriptions. So, doesn't, what, what are you trying to do? So, uh, he was stopped in his tracks, and, I, and then he was also running a, a corruption uh, case in parallel, uh, which well, was affected. At, at, at Spanish reality is always very complicated, <laughs> but basically, Walter Sarkozan was himself on trial. He was accused in three cases, in these corruption cases you mentioned, but also from a little obscure right-wing fascist movement yeah. who accused him of opening illegal illegally these cases and uh, he actually came on trial on the, on the special court for judges and in these three cases they saw enough reason to put him out of office. his office for the next 20 years I think. I think it ended up in 11 but it's enough but because okay, it's enough. his for career his, his was over yeah. and actually uh, <coughs> the, uh, that was the case. Pater Sarkozan when he started his um, action against Franco crimes, it made an end to his career. Yeah. And that was not a coincidence. Not a coincidence, and actually a lot of people in Spain say the only person who has been tried for the crimes of Francoism is the judge who tried to judge. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a caricature of what happened, but uh, it, it's, it's uh, basically... It. So, what, what happened? I mean, this, this, uh, the, he, he was absolved. I mean, after all of this, he, he went all the way to the Supreme Tribunal. I mean, the case went all the way to the Supreme Tribunal. You know, he was convicted of other case of illegal hearing, I mean, illegal tapping of uh, in a corruption scandal. He was thrown out of office for that. I mean, almost every lawyer in Spain does this. I mean, but he, he was the one who you know, won the prize. And um, and uh, and then he, well, he was absolved. Uh, do you say absolved? Or I mean, he was uh, declared innocent uh, of uh, of of. Um, of uh, see of the Franco of, of the Franco case uh, for, for breach of legal, legal duty was that uh, uh, when in, in the in the in the ruling they said yes you you you, you, you didn't breach uh, your duty but these crimes cannot be uh, judged or prosecuted which meant that there's another layer of legal. <laughs> 
a closure of the of the Fran Franco issue, this time coming all the way from the Supreme Tribunal. So that means that I think that this, the, the case in Spain is pretty much closed. There are now like two judicial, in terms of traditional justice, of how, how these things move, you know, and they go here and then they move to the other side and then it, it, the tracks stop here and then. So then there are like two new initiatives, which one of them is really interesting, which. Uh, That's, let's. Wait no, with that no. for, the, for the last one. I, I wanted to let you see another small piece of a documentary uh, about one case which actually Bobasa Carson did um, put in motion and, and had its effect. It's, it's now in the in the court in the, in Spain. Unfortunately, one of the main um, suspects is uh, an 80 year old nun died, but um, it's there, and um, we just have a look to. Because a lot of people know about it, and we can explain a bit how it is together with the other cases of digging up the past. Spain is reeling from an avalanche of shocking allegations of baby theft and baby trafficking recently revealed to have gone on for decades. <laughs> Graves are being exhumed, their contents exposing the cynical deceit used to trade in human life. Why was she so cold? She was completely frozen. Since the Spanish Civil War, hundreds of thousands of babies are believed to have been trafficked by nuns, priests, and doctors. I've been meeting the heartbroken mothers, now searching for the children they've been told had died at birth. I'm convinced they didn't bury my baby. I have always doubted the boy died. He's alive in my heart and the stolen and trafficked babies, now grown up, who are searching for their biological families and their true identity. We want to know the truth. I want her to be honest, and I want her to tell me who our mothers are. While there's hope of emotional reunions for some, the victims are reeling, asking themselves the most fundamental of questions. Where, where do you come from? Are you completely Spanish? Are you half Spanish? Are you even Spanish? Well, where are you? Okay, this is just a short track. We, we, we show it because of the fact that a lot of people have heard about this case and uh, may um, see a link between this case, also because of uh, uh, Garçon was the one who put this in motion. As a matter of fact, the stolen baby started in, in 39, so, uh, so after the, the, the war was ended. And, um, and the idea was that it, 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 it could have been a kind of Argentine-like case in which, um, for political reasons, children were robbed from the parents and, and, and brought under the uh, parenthood of uh, people who were next to the regime. The thing is, uh, the cases, the practical cases you just saw are from a later era, uh, era it's from the 70s and the 80s. And these cases are now in um, in court. Could you briefly explain? Is this indeed a kind of Ar Argentine kind of case in which the the regime systematically took away uh, children and brought them uh, to parents <coughs> next to the regime? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, well, this is a very shocking case, and, and it's now it has kind of covered up. I mean, it's like uh, now more in the news, way more in the news than the exhumations, actually. Uh, as, as Steve was saying, like uh, 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 after the war, there were a lot. Of, I mean, if if you, just, you can imagine, if they, they, they there were like 150 people shot, you know, just imagine how, how many people were in concentration camps throughout the, the, the country, uh, hundreds of thousands. And then what happened is that uh, uh, in 1939 and 1940, there was some legislation which allowed the state to take uh, into custody into the state's custody, 
uh, the children uh, of uh, particularly the, the women who were uh, incarcerated or in jail. And they, they were transferred to religious, Catholic, mostly uh, charitable organizations. And, uh, you know, uh, historians who work on this talk about a minimum of 30,000 uh, kids who, which were uh, taken from their mothers under the uh, understanding that uh, they were going to be raised into Marxism and that, that, that had to be stopped as part of the, this paranoid uh, idea that even, I mean, there was like this famous uh, Spanish psychiatrist, uh, Vallejo Nájera, who thought that, uh, but that Marxism was a gene and that was uh, transferred, you know, from genetically from one family to the other, so they had to cut, you know, the, 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 the bond between the mother and the, the child <coughs> if you were not going to have a red Spain, you know, flourishing uh, back again. So that happened in the, in the, in the, in the, in the early Francoism. And uh, the thing is that there, there, we, we still don't know very clearly how, what's the connection between these new uh, cases, which you said uh, started in, uh, which referred to the 70s and 80s, which is just after Franco died. How is this connected to, to these uh, schemes of uh, body theft that were uh, taking place during Francoism? <laughs> and actually, uh, there, there, there are like political problems between the memory the association for the recovery of historical memory, which is the way in which a lot of them are called and related to the exhumations. They do not they do they do not connect very well with the associations of stolen uh, which are searching for st st uh, stolen babies. And in some of the demonstrations, the relatives or, or, or the ones who think that they, they were stolen during the 70s or in the 80s, they carry this banner saying like, we are not historical memory, because they don't want to be confused with the other process. So there, there's there have been some tension between these two levels, and, and this, this will be sorted out in society in the, yeah. the future. OK, it makes, anyway, it makes clear how, how difficult and how, how complicated these things still are in nowadays Spain. You, you, actually, you could see at the start of the of this documentary, this uh, young guy of uh, 18 or whatever, he, he showed this Franco monument, which probably is not there anymore. Uh, after uh, one of the things of the law is that, as a result, a lot of the Franco monuments were removed. I think they are removed all except one in uh, Melilla, I think. Uh, go there if you want to see Franco in public. You still can see him there with a hat on, uh, but he probably will be removed also sooner or later. Uh, all the famous statues of Franco on the horse, they have been removed and are now in, in Musea or uh, to the shredder. Um, so some things changed, but actually a lot of people um, like this guy didn't know much about the past of his um, uh, his family, so in a way you could say, okay, um, it is a it, it has been a process of amnesia. Um, on the other hand, you see the people who at least want to have removed their grandparents from a public grave somewhere next to the road because of basically because of decency. They say, okay, we want to have a decent grave for our families. It's a shame that they are still laying there in the open. Um, the thing is, what, what should you, you do in such a case? I mean, uh, we're living now in 2013. A lot of people, at least from the Civil War, basically all people died, which is not certainly not the case uh, of the people who were <coughs> responsible during Franco time. There's still a lot of people alive. What, what do you think? Is it reasonable to reopen the case of uh, injustice, the case of crimes committed in the Franco era? Has it any use? And has it any chance? Uh, chance? Uh, we are seeing that it has <laughs> very little chances. Uh, what, what has happened is that after Garzón was dis the case was dismissed, uh, they, it's kind of funny, but Spanish uh, victims went to Argentina and they are filing complaints in, in Argentina. And there is an, in Argentina there is a case against Francoism, now, which is kind of funny in a sense because it's kind of the colony, the colony is telling the metropolis, don't go this way. But uh, 
the, the, actually the, the judge was going to come to Spain to take testimony of some of the victims and uh, the, the ambassador got kind of scared, I think, and he cancelled the visit. So I think they are doing it, uh, we say, like uh, uh, distance. At, at a distance, you know, with uh, this kind of new technologies and you know, some of the... And then there was also an attempt to go to the, to the Strasbourg Tribunal, in which we were involved, um, but it was also dismissed because we were because they, they were they would they would be they would say why is these people coming to Strasbourg now 30 years after 40 years after Franco died I mean it doesn't make any sense <laughs> so I, I think that uh, with uh, that in, in legal terms uh, nothing can be done but uh, <coughs> most of the people are, are, are dying even Fra, Fra, Fra uh, who was the founder of the right wing party he was a minister of Franco and he was one of the person who they, they, they wanted to, 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 to catch, but he, he also died. Uh, so they're, they're basically gone. But I think that in, in social terms, in symbolic terms, I mean, I am a social anthropologist, so I'm also kind of interested in what's uh, uh, other aspects of transitional justice that Nancy also mentioned before, which is not just, in, in, I mean, sometimes transitional justice is, is, is thought in, <coughs> in very legal terms, but in terms of symbolic terms, when we go to these exhumations and you've seen these, these images of, of the people just talking, uh, they, they, uh, these people who are talking, uh, Aurora, uh, all of them, they, probably they are talking for the first time in public. I mean, for the first time, the exhumation open, opens up a legitimate space for them to talk about their suffering. And this is something which is extremely important, and I think that also political, in, in, in essence. Because uh, sometimes you, you would get like a whole family going there, and they, they would start to talk to one another, and they hadn't ever before uh, had this conversation at home, but they do it in the exclamation. So I think that, that this coming out of the closet, of, closet of, of the victims of Francoism, has been uh, has been uh, it, I mean amidst controversy, it has been really healthy for the country in the long run, and now we are moving into a different phase. Uh, these exhumations had been one, one of the things about the law of historical memory. Do you want me to, to talk a little bit more about this? Is that during 2006 and 2012 there has been funding for these exhumations provided by the state, but in this subcontracting system, like you would be like an association, you would apply for money in a, in a competition. You know, you know, I want 60,000 euros now, and they would say, okay, okay, your project is approved. Now here you have the money and just go and, and, and do it yourself. So it was a subcontracting sub, sub system. The state did not take responsibility. So for example, in terms of identifications, a lot of the people who are being exhumed are not being identified because the technical means are just not there. For, for, they are very expensive. You know, if you want to go to DNA testing, like for example in, in, uh, in Bosnia and some other places, you need a lot of money and you also need databases and you need soft software to run you know the, the different uh, uh, the, the data you have this this software is available this, this, the Spanish government has this software but it's not releasing it to be used in these things which you know puts a responsibility on the technical teams who, who they have to you know they are extremely imaginative in the ways in which they work just to do these matches and it would be extremely easy if the, if the, if the, if the government would you know, be more involved. But they decided not to do it. They decided not to have a central uh, <coughs> commission of experts, you know, kind of coordinating the whole, the, all the exclamations. They would only give the money. Say, so, like, do it yourself. And I think that was one, one of the biggest mistakes of the biggest mistakes of the Zapatero government. But now, we are even looking at it, you know, with some nostalgia, because with the coming up to power of Partido Popular, right-wing power, party they were not happy with this at all since the very beginning they would understand that somebody wants to get his of her grand grandparent uh, but they they, they, they really didn't help and now with the economic crisis and whatnot this money has vanished and i don't think it's going to happen again so we are back to the situation you've seen in the movie you know after all Garzon, after the law of historical memory, after all the scandals, and after all the media visibility and whatnot, we are back to volunteerism. And just to go back and, and just, uh, uh, you know, buying a sandwich and sleeping on the floor and, and you know, uh, working on our spare time because the state has disappeared for good. Uh, I, don't, I don't, so I don't know if we are worse or better. I think that the process has been very important, 
but uh, we, we have to, 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 to kind of try to see what's going to happen next because we really don't know. That's, uh, that's but uh, the, the, the use of... of um, Perhaps you can of take the mic, then the, they can hear it. Uh, the use of exclamations, that is so very important. You see it all over the world. How can you create a new future? How can you create a society of democracy uh, when there are still thousands of mass graves? That is not possible. Como se puede crear un futuro sobre, sobre miles de fosas? Well, that's a good question. Um, the question? Is, is that's that, a remark. <laughs> it's a good remark, sorry. Is that correct? Do you think it's necessary to finally get um, at least these bodies up to have a new start? Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's completely necessary because these, these mass graves were seeded in every village as part of a terror strategy. And the dictatorship was founded on the very existence of these mass graves and other forms of repression which came in, went, in, went in parallel. So you cannot leave you know, alone, just forget, you know, these, these mass graves, which were part of the, of the, I mean, if you want to take out the monuments, that's very important, but the mass graves are even more important, because the main message to the Spanish society was sent through these, 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 these mass graves. Yeah. I think that now, uh, maybe, maybe, because there has been a lot of, uh, I, I think that um, it's all, another interesting thing is, the, the, the role of the media in all of this. I mean, because this, this, uh, there has been a lot of deploy, media deployment of these of these exhumed bodies, which at some points it has looked uh, a bit pornographic, so to speak, no? in the sense that there have been images. I mean, you just go, I, I have, I, I don't like uh, new media very much, but I, I have, as a researcher, I have to, to go into them. I have a Facebook uh, profile, and I am friends of most of the associations. So every time I log into the, into uh, into my Facebook account, I have a, a body there, you know, a skeleton, you know, because somebody, is, because now they go with uh, with the smartphones and to the exhumations and they just uh, take a picture of the of the bow of the bodies and and, the, and and immediately load it into their Flickr, uh, 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 WhatsApp, you know, any of the of the of the new media. So I think that to understand also this 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 process. We, we need to, to, to see the way in which these bodies are circulating in society because I think that maybe we've seen too many of them because they have been all over the place and this is not uh, um, a, criti a critique of the association but uh, 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 um, they, want the truth. they want they want the truth the truth is so important exclamation that, remain, that, that means truth knowing the truth now, 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 that is an easy thing to say because it's very difficult, of course, after such a long sure. time to, uh, to find the truth. I mean, uh, it was already quite a messy situation in the Civil War um, because that practically you are saying you should also do some legal work. And it. truth means also that you look for the people who were basically uh, responsible for these crimes. Um, do you think that is a realistic... Uh, option for Spain. Well, let me let me tell you what happens in an exhumation where, in legal terms, because uh, these exhumations are taking place in an in a, a legal space. So they are not illegal, but they are not legal either. They are they are not a crime scene legally because there is no. I mean, in Argentina, for example, you wouldn't see an exhumation like this. Somebody with a bone here, or yes, relatives just uh, hanging out or crying. No, because it's uh, all the exhumations take place because, because there is a judicial mandate to do this, and this the forensics just go there and they have these rules and this. You know, it's within a criminal process. In Spain, it's just you know anybody can show up. You know, you. you uh, it's, it's really a, yeah. a different but kind of... But there's a parallel with Chile, I think, because uh, there was recently a film about survivors still looking in the Atacama Desert. Yeah, yeah. And and it's it's very very yeah. yeah, was exactly. a wonderful movie. It was, yeah. And it was very... Well, it wasn't similar because they were there on their own, you know, it was just sifting through the dust. Yeah. But the same kind of situation, there's nothing in place yeah. to, to kind of support that it, that it was actually a crime or whatever. It's just... So the, the associations, yeah. what they do is like, uh, just because they want yeah. it to be a crime, they want to say, this yeah. is a crime scene. 
So what they do is they, they go to the judge or to the civil guard in the neighbor, in, I mean the the, the mm -hmm. closest one, yeah. and they would say, "Look, we found some bodies in the countryside, right. you know, with uh, bullet you. holes, yeah. you know, with, yeah. with with bullet to the tourist coast." And then immediately the police would go. The, the, the judicial police goes and yeah. shows up in the exhumation. Because they have to. Yeah. They have to because maybe it's five years old and it's you know a crime. You know. And when they know it's a it's a it's a it's, 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 it's related to the civil war, they dismiss the case. Yeah. And this has happened once and again and again and again. And associations continue to go. And every time they find the bodies, they just file a complaint. And they come. They have to do the report. But then they go back and they say, well, I'm not competent. And, and this has happened has happened uh, all the time, which is, is a very sad situation. And in terms of truth, it's, it's a very important question. How do you define truth? In legal terms, in sociological terms, in historiographical terms? Because in legal terms, this is not going to be, this is not a legal truth. Because, uh, for example, when the forensic teams do their reports, these reports have no legal value. They are done exactly as if they were, as, as, as the, uh, as the ones that have been done in, in, in Argentina or, or Bosnia. The same kind of uh, report, you know, they, they follow the same protocols. But here it has no legal value, whereas in Bosnia has legal, it has legal value and it goes all the way to, all, all the, way to the court, uh, the international court. And in Argentina it goes to the... So that, that's the, the, the sad situation of the Spanish case, which is kind of... The, 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 there has been every attempt to, 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 to put a judicial coverage, I mean, to, to create a, a judicial coverage around, around these exhumations, and it just didn't happen. Uh, these are technical things up to a certain point, but do you think that there can be another form, or do you think it's necessary still to have some kind of reconciliation within Spanish society? I mean, in a sense, you could say this whole process of amnesia was quite successful, uh, if you agree or not, is another case, but uh, Spain have chosen with the transition right and left to do a process of amnesia. We don't talk about it. Um, let's go on to a beautiful new democracy and uh, forget the past. Do you think that after this period, uh, there, there's clearly a lot of people who still say, okay, but it can't be that we can um, just forget our history. As a matter of fact, it's not forgotten because you see a lot of movies, a lot of books, uh, literature, um, public discussion. It's not a question that it's taboo. People are talking about it. But it's not a matter of reconciliation. Nobody says, you were responsible for that and that crime under the Franco dictatorship. Do you think that another form of reconciliation is necessary and possible? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a very interesting question because I, I don't know what reconciliation means. Uh, because it could be like an empty shell or it, could, it depends on the content. The, because for example, the value of the fallen is a monument to reconciliation. I mean, this is what you know people from uh, Francois Nostalgic could say. But it's a monument to all Spaniards. It's a monument of reconciliation. You have people from one side and the other ones are stolen, the other ones legitimate. But you know, who cares? It's but so I, I mean, I mean, the, these words are very are very uh, tricky, you know, because reconciliation can mean it, it's it's more symbolic. It's also uh, you know, I, I think there, the Spanish society has become way more mature with this. I think so, less candid, you know, less Truman Show, so to speak. Uh, and, and uh, so I think that in terms of uh, what New York Institute is doing, the, the Spanish case is very interesting in the way in which a dream, you know, of reconciliation shatters, you know, uh, 40 years after the fact. And uh, in comparative terms, I think that's, uh, that's, really, that's really interesting. In terms of reconciliation, uh, I think that uh, in, uh, it has happened more at a local level. So there have been a lot of controversies between the political parties in the parliament, shouting, you know, uh, at, uh, at each other, you know, very, very tense uh, discussions. But in the villages, it's, it's, I mean, you could see sometimes, you know, like the, 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 the son of the person who was guilty of the murders showing up in the excavation as a means of solidarity. I mean, this kind of, if maybe we can talk about micro-reconciliation, which uh, is another, you know, we anthropologists, social anthropologists, who 
work with uh, social relations on a face-to-face -face basis. So, so we value these things also, uh, as opposed to you know national reconciliation, which might seem too abstract a concept. But uh, if you sum you know thousands of micro reconciliations, maybe you have like like a, a different kind of social fabric which is more healthy. And I, I think in terms of uh, quality of democracy, it has this this has helped improving it. Even when now the crisis and the corruption is bringing us back 30 years, but uh, that's, yeah. okay. that's got to be controlled. I have to Reconciliation does, uh, cannot be a starting point. Last year in Spain, there has Could been you please stay to me? That cannot reconciliation cannot be a starting point. There, for that, you you need what what the families of the victims ask every uh, Tuesday on the Plaza del Sol in Madrid, verdad, uh, justicia, uh, reparación, the, the truth, the, the justice, and reparation. Okay, uh, re reparation, I don't know. Well, and as last year that was created in, in, the, in the month of September, uh, the Truth Commission. And I should very be very grateful if you could tell me what's the situation now. Walter Sargasson with, was present on that moment there too. Perhaps he took the initiative, I don't know. But the commission is there. Um, not that I know. I mean, I, like, oh, yeah. aware of this. Like an, an official truth commission? An official. The question was that uh, the, the commission doesn't come from the, from the government, yeah. like in, in yeah. Argentina and in Chile. But as Balthazar Cazón said, it has to come from us, yeah. from the, the, the families of the, the victims. So the, the civil population, let's say. But I don't know, I, I, I don't know how's the situation now. Perhaps you could tell me. Yeah, uh, my feeling is that, that the whole uh, movement for the recovery of historical memory is losing momentum. It's losing momentum because uh, it's, been, it's been a very, very tough 10 years. And I have seen a lot of the leaders of the different associations uh, just, just uh, leaving because they cannot take it anymore, because it's taking a toll on their families, because uh, it's, been a, it's, been, it's, been, it's been really terrible for them. Emilio Silva retired last week. He said, I'm, I'm gone because I cannot take this anymore. And, and, uh, so, uh, and then we, we have a, a, terrible, a terrible crisis now. And, and the, the exhumation is completely out of the news. Now, <coughs> you, you need an exhumation with uh, 20 children just to, to, to catch the, the media's attention, whereas at the very beginning, beginning every, everything, every bone would be, would be news. Now, after 10 years of being on the front pages of the newspapers, in the país, El Mundo, some others, after documentaries, after documentaries, uh, uh, I, I think that there is some kind of saturation of, uh, of the empathy that one could, could feel to, to, towards these kind of uh, these, these victims, which is not good or bad, it's just the way things are in societies. There are like cycles in which suddenly there is like a flow of solidarity to certain victims, and 10 years later, the solidarity goes somewhere else. But uh, I, I am a bit, uh, uh, I, I think that it's, it's, it's losing momentum, and I know very well the people in the, in the, in the Puerta del Sol, and I, they, they have done a, a wonderful uh, so work. So courageous, fantastic. Yeah. They, 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 like they, the, are, they are fantastic. The mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in, in Argentina. I want to wrap up. Um, if there is one question more than the last one, please. I have a uh, question. Um, is there any change in the attitude of the church during the last 10 years? Anything? <coughs> is there? Change, not, not particularly. Uh, <laughs> They're very silent, no? No, they have been uh, very <laughs> outspoken, but... Uh, past, no, 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 they, they, they completely opposed this. I mean, they said, this is opening up. I mean, the, the same discourse you could hear in this, uh, this, this group of people from the Blue Division, just uh, with this mass and whatnot, like, we already forgave them, you know, the winners forgiving the defeated, you know, after the repression. Kind of funny to hear these things, no? but uh, the the church has is has been completely against institutionally, you no? Know, because you also have 
you know, please in, the, in some certain areas which are, you know, have different ideologies and the church is very diverse and whatnot. But as an institution, the church has been completely opposed to the opening up of mass graves because in one, they, they, were, they were complicit with these crimes. You know, it was like the, basically the major, the, I mean, the, 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 the priests in the villages, the ones who were making up the list or whatever. Also, they, they obviously during the war, they suffered a lot of uh, religious persecution. They did suffer, but they have been digging up their martyrs for 70, 80 years, and they continue to do it today. As we are researchers of contemporary exhumations, I've also been in an exhumation which uh, was uh, uh, asked, asked well, we were asked to do this exhumation by the, by the church because they wanted to look for some martyrs of Republican repression. And we also did it, and we did an, an incredible research, and, and we did research within the church, but they are all the time exhuming martyrs. And in 2008, there was like biggest beatification in the history of Christendom in Rome, because 498 martyrs of the civil war were beatified in Rome. So on the one hand, they are saying, this is divisive, don't open mass graves. On the other, one, on the other hand, they are beatifying, I think it's an hypocritical move, but it's... Uh, but on the other hand, they are beatifying their own uh, people killed in the, civil, in the same civil war. So I don't think that the, the, the church has been very reasonable. I mean, it could have been easier, you know, and I, I think it would be, it would have been greater, great for Spain that the church had come forward saying, like, we support this. And the same for the um, Partido Popular. If they had said, we support this, it would have saved a lot of problems to themselves and to the, and to the country, but they didn't have the courage, or, or I don't know. It's difficult to assess at this point. Uh, very, very, very last question, if you can keep it short. I just wanted to uh, know, I know that it was a political silence between parties, but I have read that there, on a cultural level, there was well discussion in the last decades. So, uh, in on the theater, literature, so I wonder um, what you can say about this, so that on a cultural, the difference between the dealing with the topic on a cultural level and on, on a scientific level and the universities and, and the political level. Yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, historians, for example, uh, say that they have been very, uh, in this documentary there are a lot of historians who, who talk and it's okay, I mean they are wonderful, all of them, you know, uh, Spinoza, Casanova, etc. But the, the the, the majority of, of historians have been opposed to the to this, and uh, they have um, they, they have not supported the association because they would say, okay, we have done research on this uh, repression for 15 years. We have written, I don't know, to say a number, 50,000 pages about repression, and they would tell the leaders of the associations, first go and read these uh, books, and then come to talk to us because you don't know what you're talking about. And, and, and my question would be the, the, the opposite, like, how come that historiography has not leaked down to the people? So people doesn't know uh, that this, this happened because in the villages they don't know. And the same with the cultural industries. Uh, obviously there has been a lot of, uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of movies and novels about the civil war, but specifically about this kind of repression, not that many. And still today we don't have that many theater plays about exhumations in in particular, or, or movies about exhumation or, or whatnot. So this is something that will eventually happen, and I think this is the healthiest space for memory, you know, um, for the recovery of memory, you know, the art, which is, I think that's the, 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 the place where more freedom can be, uh, to, to express the, this trauma uh, is, is to be found. So I am very optimistic that eventually some, pe some people would, you know, do art with it. Okay. Let's close down with these bit optimistic um, remarks after a quite, a, perhaps a bit depressive um, um, evening. I hope not. Um, I hope it gave you some insight of the complexities and the difficulties which still exist in Spain in remembering uh, and reconciliating its past. Anyway, let's hope that at least in a cultural level, in a cultural uh, platform, these things in the next coming year will have their right place and um, that Spain can look in a more open way to its recent and not so recent past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.